Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2, starting in verse number 1, and it says, Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder, and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and shalt dash them in, in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are they that put their trust in him. The title of this message is Kiss the Son. Kiss the Son. Let's pray together. Dear Father, I thank You, Lord God Almighty, that You have given us Your only begotten Son, and by Him and Him alone we can have redemption from our sins. I pray, God, that we today would humble ourselves before You and want to be better sons and daughters of You. That we'd repent of our sins and confess them to You and get right with You and follow You wherever You want us to go. Wherever, Lord. Let us do what You want us to do. Not what our hearts desire, but let us have uh, Your desires in our hearts. Thank You, God, so much for the people that are here today. I, play, I pray, Lord, that this would be a blessing to them. That You would use Your Word and your unworthy vessel. Thank you, God, so much. You're so good to us all the time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. In America, there has been a huge decline in the number of people wanting to be police officers. Huge. They're even lowering their standards to try to get more police officers to work. You hear it time and time again on the, on the news, police brutality. You hear it time and time that uh, the police are shooting innocent people. And you know what? They're, the police, they, they proclaim it that the police are the problem. Black Lives Matter say, you're shooting us and beating us because we're black. The white people are saying, you are shooting us and beating us because you are abusing your authority. And the police are being treated as the criminal. Now, I'm not saying that all police are perfect. I'm not saying that there isn't bad police, because there is bad police, but they're being treated as criminals in this nation. And the police just say, hey man, you broke the law. You broke the law, and not only that, you won't obey my command. Have you seen these videos? I would say eight out of ten of them, it's always some guy that gets shot, but he never listened to the police officer to begin with. Stop! Don't move! Don't put your hands in your pockets! What does he do? He moves, puts his hands in his pockets. It's so, something happened at work that really irked me, and it was uh, our ladder truck, which is a big truck, got into an accident with a man, a little fender bender. And so we got out, the police arrived. We we're out there with a the guy that we got in the wreck with, and we're sitting out there with two police officers and five firemen. And this man said, I am, uh, I'm kind of nervous, and I'm kind of worried about my odds here. You guys are all against me. And, and with, with fire in the police's eyes, he, he, didn't, uh, he didn't act on how he felt, but he said, Sir, you're in the safest place you could be in right now. You're with two police officers and five firemen. Give me a break. Right. Man, that, it, I mean, I, I wanted to say a lot of things, but I didn't. Man, 
So what it comes down to is, is people want the police to respond when their house is being broken into. The police, they want the police to lay down their lives when they're in their time of trouble. But please don't tell me that I'm doing something wrong. Please don't tell me what I'm doing. Don't uphold the laws of the land and my freedom, quote unquote, to break them. How dare you, say they. How dare you that I'm driving a, a 35, a 35, driving 100 miles an hour in a 35 zone, and and you you want to stop me and ask for my license and registration, and as you pull me over, a a a, a big smoke of marijuana smoke comes out of the out of the window, and you see me holding a 40 in my hand, and you want me to step out of my car? You see a gun on my. Uh, on my driver's seat, you see me not wearing my seatbelt, you see me having plates that are expired on a stolen vehicle, and you want me to listen to you? How dare you? It's nuts. It's crazy. They want the police to die for them. Are you hearing me? They want the police to die for them, but don't you dare tell me the law. Don't you dare make me follow the laws of the land. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is mankind, isn't it? This is mankind's view to the almighty, thrice holy God. I want you to be my savior. I want you to, to help me when I'm, when I'm sick, when I'm hurting. But don't you dare try to tell me how to live. No, no, sir. No, that's, that, is, that is not our savior, by the way. That is not God almighty, by the way. In verse number one, it says, why do the heathen rage? Why do the heathen rage? Psalm chapter two is a multifaceted Holy Spirit breathed account written by the hand of David, by the Holy Spirit. And it is a fulfilled prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ coming into this earth and uh, as, as God's anointed, his anointed, but also it is a prophecy that that uh, will come to pass, that all the wicked will be destroyed. All those who will not bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ will be cast into the lake of fire which burneth forever. That will happen. And not only that, it's a prophecy of Jesus Christ sitting on the throne of David, ruling with a rod of iron. So point or, uh, verse number one, it says this in chapter two, it says, why do the heathen rage? Why do the heathen rage? And the people in Imagine a vain thing. A heathen is a pagan. A pagan. A Gentile who worships idols. A heathen is one that is unacquainted, unacquainted with, the, with the true and living God. Rage is described in the Hebrew word as a tumultuously assembled or an angry mob. That's what it says here. Why do the heathen rage? Why do these people that know not God, they're not acquainted with the true God, why are they coming together mad? People imagine vain things. The word people can also be known as nations, the Jewish nation. Why do they imagine, think, meditate on a vain thing? Something that's empty, something that is fruitless, something that is earthly, sensual, devilish of this world. Why are they imagining? Why, why is Israel thinking on these things? Why are the heathen and the Jews coming together in rage, vehemently hating Something. Why are they foaming at the mouth with hatred? In verse number two, it says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together. What are they all coming against? It has to be someone that hates them. It has to be with someone that is just going to come in and to destroy their families. It has to be someone that just wants to take everything from them. That's who they must be gathering against in rage to fight against. Who is it? No, it says the Lord. Do you see that? It says the Lord. He says they're gathered against the Lord and who? His anointed. Jehovah God, that is who the heathen, those who know not God in this verse is talking about, that's who these kings and rulers are coming against, is the one who gave them life, the one who gave them everything that they have. They're coming against Jehovah God and his anointed, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse number one, it's a very good question. Why? Why? It's crazy, isn't it? Why? Why are you going against the God who gave you life? Why are you going against the Lord Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, who is pure, who is perfect, who came healing those that are sick, 
who came forgiving sins, who is God that was manifest in the flesh, offering forgiveness for all that would come unto Him. Why do the heathen rage? Why? Why did they cry out, crucify Him? Why did they gather together in this rage and cry out from their black and dark hearts, crucify Him? Crucify Him. Verse number 3 leads us to this. It says this in verse 3, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. You see, in that little town of Bethlehem was born a Savior, was born the Messiah, was born Jesus Christ. But He wasn't just an ordinary baby. He was born King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He was born to rule and to reign this earth. And you know what? Had a, had, the people had a big problem with this. That is, if He is Lord, what's that mean? I'm not. If He's King, what's that mean? I'm not. There's a big problem with that. You have to bow your knee to someone other than yourself. Why do the heathen rage? They don't want to bow their knee. Why do people imagine a vain thing? They don't want to bow their knee to anybody but themselves. Anything that profits them. Because listen, there is no king but Christ. That is it. There is no king but Christ. Herod, a king from the beginning, was striving to break these bands asunder. He was trying to uh, uh, mess up God's plan. He was trying to mess up the kingdom of God and put a stop on it. But Herod was just a king. He wasn't the king. Now listen to me. Go to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 2. Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 2. It says, saying, is this, go to verse number 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east uh, to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we are come to worship him. You come to worship him and not me? i got a problem with that, says Herod. I'm king. I'm the one that is deserving of worship. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 16, it says, when, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, they didn't come back and tell him if they found the child, was exceedingly wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and, and in all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently required of the wise men. He was trying to stop the kingdom of God. He was trying to put a stop to this king that was born in Bethlehem. Let's go to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, 8 through 25. And when Herod, a different Herod, listen, saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because, uh, because he has heard many things of him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and the scribes stood vehemently accusing him. And Herod, went with his men of war, set him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate. And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were enemy, for at enemy, enmity between themselves. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto them, You have brought this man unto me as one that per perver perverteth the people. Perverteth the people, and behold, I have examined him before you, and have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof you accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chasten him, chastise him, and release him. For of necessity he must release one of them from one of them at the feast. And they cried out 
all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who was a certain for a certain sedition made in the city, for and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake against spake again unto them, but they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, Why, what evil hath he done? I found no cause of death in him. I therefore uh, chastise, ch chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. Why? Why? Why do the heathen rage and people imagine a vain thing? Why does the kings and the rulers fight? against God Almighty? Why did the chief priests and the scribes vehemently accuse him? Why did Herod's soldiers mock him and ridicule the Lord Jesus Christ? That Nobody told him to do that. They did it out of their own volition, out of their own hearts. They put that crown of thorns upon his head and they spit upon him and they smote him. They did that because they had hatred in their heart. Why did did Pilate and Herod come together that day as friends against the Lord Jesus Christ? Why did they want to kill the one who has come to make them free? Why? Why do the heathen rage? It's simple. Like I've already said, they want a Savior, but they don't want a Lord. They want a Savior, but they don't want a King. They love their sin more than they love God. They love their darkness rather than the light. They want to stay in the darkness. Who did they want in this scripture? Who did they want? Barabbas. They wanted a murderer. They wanted their sin. They wanted their death. They wanted their destruction. Kill Jesus. We don't want him. We want our sin. Turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, 18 through 20. I'll just start in verse uh, John 3, 16 to start there. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not on him is condemned already, because he, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. What does the world want today? What do they cry out today? Give us Barabbas! That's what they cry out today. Turn on your television. Turn on the radio. Turn on the news. What do they cry out? Give us Barabbas. Get rid of Jesus. Kill him. Get rid of him. Get rid of this light that is hindering our love of sin and love of self. Get rid of it. They want God's word gone. They want to get rid of it. They want to get rid of God's people and God's church. We are hindering them. We are hindering their good time. God's law written upon their hearts. They want to get rid of it. And one day, man, God's going to give them what they want. One day, God's going to take that Holy Spirit, His Holy Spirit, away. Sure, this, this, this world loves a false Jesus. It loves this Jesus of, I'll just, I'm just your genie in a bottle. I'm just going to save you. I'm not your Lord. I'm not, I'm not your king. I'm just your savior. The world loves it. Come down to uh, Oregon District with me sometime. I go down there about 9 o'clock. It starts getting crazy around 10 and 11. The streets are full, are full of bars, pornography shops. And you go down there and you preach and you see why do the heathen rage and, and why people imagine a vain thing. They hate it. They hate the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I meet a lot of people that love Jesus, but they love a false Jesus. They come up to me. Oh, yeah, blankety blank. 
taking the Lord's name in vain, guzzling their beer, doing everything that their flesh wants. Oh, yeah, I love Jesus. He's my friend. Oh, yeah, he's your friend, all right. You know what Jesus said? He said that if you're my friends, only if you do whatever I command you. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You cannot separate this about our dear Savior. He is all loving, but He demands obedience. And as a child of God, if you're saved today, you have a desire within yourself to be obedient unto Him. To serve Him out of love. Not out of restraint. Not out of uh, being bound to it, but you are bound to Him in love. You see, the mystery of iniquity has been working ever since God created Adam and Eve in the garden. They've been trying to stop the kingdom of God. They're trying to stop, stop God and His anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ. The principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness of this world and, and spiritual wickedness in high places, the devil and his fallen wicked angels. You know what they're thirsty for? The souls of men. But also they're thirsty to stop God's kingdom. And they want to use men in their insane approach to stop something that's unstoppable. The devil's insane, people. Satan's nuts. He wants to fight God. It's crazy. But he uses dark men's hearts to do his bidding for them. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter four. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse three and four. It says, But but if our gospel be hid, it is him to them that, that, that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Who is the God of this world? Satan. What did he do? He blinded their eyes. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 7 and 8. It says in verse number 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden, hidden wisdom which, which God ordained before the, world, before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Wow. The God of this world hid the truth from their eyes. Why do kings, why are they gathered together? Why are rulers gathered together? To try to stop the Lord Jesus Christ. To try to stop His kingdom. How could they not see that this is the Messiah spoken in the, in the Word of God? How could they not see? Their, their eyes are blinded. Blinded by the devil. Blinded by their father, as it says in John chapter 8, 44 through 47. Their father, the devil. Blinded their eyes. So let me ask you a question about all this them trying to stop the kingdom of God. What does God think about it? How does He feel? Is He up in heaven? Is He worried? Is He scared thinking, man, Satan may, may, may stop us here. He's looking like He's getting pretty strong. Satan may be able to take over. Verse 4 of, of Psalm, chapter number 2. This is what the Lord thinks. This is what the Lord's doing in heaven. He sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Do you see that? The Lord shall laugh. Satan and all his demons and the most powerful men and uh, military equipment that you can think of is nothing. It's laughable to God. It's It's funny. The thing I was, I was trying to think of an illustration. This is not even a this is not even a good one. But man, just imagine uh, you're leaving your house. You got plans to go to work, and all of a sudden, when you're walking, you hear something going. Ah! You're like, what was that? You look down, and you see a little ant on the floor, and you go, Did that ant talk? Can that ant? Does he speak English? You grab your microphone, go lay it down in front of that 
aunt, and he just goes, you're not doing what you planned today. I'm stopping you. You look down, you see, are you, are you serious? I mean, you would have to laugh. You're like, who's, are you, you're doing it? Your little guy, yeah, we're taking you down. Okay. <laughs> See you later. That is, that is in a nutshell of the devil and his army against the all-powerful, all almighty God. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. The only thing Satan and his wicked army can do is what God allows him to do. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ was murdered. Who murdered him? Who was it? The heathen? The people of Israel who imagined a vain thing? I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop this man. I'm going to stop him from teaching. I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to kill him. We're going to end all this. It's, it's a vain thing. The kings of the earth, yes, they killed him. But through their wicked hearts, God allowed them to. I don't understand it either. But that's the truth. Jesus said, no man taketh my life from me. I lay it down willingly. I'm the good shepherd. He laid it down willingly. But he didn't make him kill him. He knew it. Look at uh, Acts chapter 2. So many mysteries in the Bible. Here's one. Acts chapter 2. Verse 23 and 24. Him being delivered by the predetermined counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, being because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Did you hear me? He was delivered unto them. He gave his life, but yet by their wicked hearts and their vain imaginations and their rage, they slew the sinless Son of God. Who can stop God's kingdom? This is exciting to me. I, like, I love just talk, thinking about this because our brains sometimes, we just don't think like this. Who can stop God's church? Who can stop God's gospel? Who can stop God's word? Who can stop His plan and His purpose? Anybody? No one. No one. No one can stop Him and His purpose. Stop looking around and thinking that you're on the losing side. If you're born again, my friend, you're on the winning side. That's a wonderful thing. This world is a mess, but not for much longer. God's going to fix this place. And He's already won. When Jesus was upon that cross, you know what He yelled? He yelled, It is finished. All the Jews and the heathen and the people that love their sin and love this world heard that and they said, yeah, we got him. It's finished. All his teachings and his kingdom. Yes. He finally admitted it. After he died, he, he rose the white flag. He's done. He's, he's gone. He's, he, he lost the battle. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse number 13. Colossians 2, starting in verse number 13. And you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of, of ordinances that that was against us, which is contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Verse 15. And having spoiled the principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In what? The cross. Openly. When he cried out, it is finished, he looked at the devil and said, yeah, you're finished. This is it. It's done. All my children that will be saved are atoned for. It is finished. It is completely done. The victory is mine. Glory to God. He is the champion. He is the king. And what's going to happen? Psalm verses uh, 4 and 5 in chapter 2. It says, 
He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. All of them. It's sad, but all that will not bow at the Lord Jesus Christ. All. Then shall he break, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Verse number 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. It's not a hard thing to do, is it? To break a potter's vessel, is it? With a rod of iron. Get you a baseball bat and a vase. Doesn't take much. That's what God's going to do to all those who hear the gospel, those who love their sin and won't bow at the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be over. All those that oppose him will be over. Look at Psalm 37. Psalm 37 and verse number 13. It says, The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that the day is coming. It's coming. He's long-suffering, but that day is coming. Look at Proverbs with me real quickly. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, starting in verse number 20. Look what it says here. It says, Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. What is wisdom? It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. That is Christ. He is the wisdom. She crieth in the chief place of the concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city. She uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And ye scorners delight in scorning, and ye fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my, re my reproof. Repent. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make you known the words. Un I will make my words known unto you. Verse 24, because I have called and ye have refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock you when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not, they, they shall not find me. For they, that, for they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. That's a scary thing, isn't it? That's a scary thing to hear the gospel and one day to keep rejecting it, keep rejecting it, and keep rejecting it and, and thumbing your nose at God and saying, I'm going to do things my way. God's going to laugh at, at, at their calamity. He says, I'm going to give you every opportunity to repent, to come unto me. You heard the wisdom of God. You heard of my son. His arms are open wide. Come unto me. All. All who will hear me, come unto me and have rest and forgiveness. But yet they love their sin and love this world. Verse number 6 in, in Psalm, it says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. No matter what's going on in this wicked world, he has set his king upon the holy hill of Zion. Christ is king. There is no king but Christ. He is the winner. He is the victor. Always has been and always will be. Christ is victor. And now we must do the same thing. Those who are born again, those that are on the winning side, those that are on Christ's side, the hallelujah side, we must do what Jesus Christ did. What did he do? Look at verse number 7 and 8. It says, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. What should we be doing? Asking God for his inheritance. Every one of us in here, if you're saved today, you were a heathen. 
You knew not God, but God saved you and poured, pulled you out of that mire. He pulled you out of the dark pit of sin and destruction. And you are now His inheritance. Now we must declare the decree that Jesus Christ is the victor. He won that Calvary's cross. We must go forth to the heathen. Go forth to those that know not God. Do the same thing that God did for us. He sent His only begotten Son. It says in John chapter 1 and verse 18, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Glory to God. Declare that He is the Messiah. Declare that there is victory. And the only victory is through Christ Jesus. Jesus. That is it. In closing here, we've got a few more verses to go. In verse number 10, it says this, Be wise now therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Be wise. Don't fight against something you're not going to win. Don't kick against the pricks as Paul did. Humble yourself. Bow at the knee now. Before you bow at the knee and, and God throws you in a place that you can never get out. Bow with a knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Be wise. In verse number 11, it says, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Rejoice with trembling. Rejoice. God could have uh, smashed you as the pot sheared. He, he could have smashed you. He could have thrown you in, in a place of hell and death and destruction. But man, rejoice with fear. He didn't. He sent His only begotten Son that we can be saved by Him and Him alone. That our sins can be blotted out by the Son, by the Lord, by the King, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what should we do? Verse number 12, kiss the Son. Kiss Him. Bow at the knee to Him as Lord and Savior and God, knowing that you do deserve to be broken as the pot. You deserve to be thrown in a place of destruction. But because of His love and mercy, He went to the cross. He defeated death and hell and sin. Satan and the devil. So kiss the Son, lest He be angry. And ye perish from the way when His wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are they that put their trust in Him. As it says in closing, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse number 36. Jaylee, you can come on up and sing a closing hymn. But in the Scripture, you can, you can see there's definitely two crowds. There's a there's a crowd that uh, is enraged about the Lord Jesus Christ being a king over them. Then there are others that are blessed, that put their trust in Him. So that's the main thing you need to wrestle with. Are you saved? Are you on the winning side? It's a wonderful thing to know that you're on the winning side. It says in John chapter 3 and verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him.